Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Elizabeth Wood, a professor of political science at Yale University. Professor Wood's current research focuses on sexual violence during war. She is the author of Insurgent Collective Action and Civil War in El Salvador and Forging Democracy from Below, Insurgent Transitions in South Africa and El Salvador, as well as various scholarly articles. Today we'll talk with Professor Wood about two of her recently published works on sexual violence during war. Welcome, Professor Wood. Thanks very much for having me. You have researched sexual violence occurring in wars throughout the world. Yeah. What is your most important finding? Yes, I visited Sri Lanka, Israel, Palestine, South Africa, Peru, Colombia, all for this project on wartime sexual violence. Uh, the most important finding for me was also the most surprising finding in my work on this uh, subject so far, and that is that there are armed groups that don't engage in widespread sexual violence. Indeed, there are some conflicts where neither party to the conflict engages in sexual violence. So there's really an absence of sexual violence in some conflicts. Why do you think that is? Um, can you cite some examples? Sure. There are various reasons why an armed group might not engage in sexual violence. So for example, the leadership of a group might decide it is against their strategic interests or against their normative beliefs if their combatants engage in sexual violence. Uh, there, there might be a number of reasons. For example, they might depend on civilians for high quality intelligence and might reason that if they engage in widespread sexual violence against those civilians, civilians will stop uh, providing such intelligence. But whether or not that message gets down to the combatants on the ground, of course, depends on the quality of the military hierarchy. So that's another uh, condition for an absence of sexual violence. But there may also be on the ground dynamics going on in other cases. So for example, if combatants believe, for example, for religious re uh, reasons, that engaging in sexual violence across some ethnic cleavage would be polluting to themselves, then they may not engage in sexual violence for that reason. I see. Why is it important to study sexual violence during wartime? Sexual violence is a form of violence against some of the most vulnerable populations in war zones. Um, the most typical case of sexual violence is um, rape of girls and women, sometimes repeated over an extended period of time. And um, those populations are often defenseless, often extremely poor, often with very few resources um, to uh, uh, try to overcome this horrible event. And sexual violence may have very long-run consequences, not just for the victims of sexual violence, but for the social fabric of communities. But if I'm right that sexual violence varies this, the way that I described, that there are armed groups that do not engage in sexual violence, it's also very important um, that we document and analyze that because that fact, if I'm right, has important policy implications. Why? Because if there are armed groups that don't engage in sexual violence, that means that leaderships, if they really want to, can prohibit sexual violence and therefore, we have uh, a position, we have evidence against this idea that sexual violence is endemic during war, it's just part of the horrors of war, and therefore we have more grounds to hold responsible those groups that do engage in sexual violence. Okay, so in doing your research, you have found um, variations in the types of sexual violence yeah. from war to war. Can you? Um, cite some specific examples? Sure. Um, so the type of sexual violence in some settings is the rape, for example, in an afternoon of um, the girls and women in some village, for example. But it may also take the form of sexual slavery, where those girls and women may be taken um, essentially as slaves by an armed group mm -hmm. and held um, forcibly, sometimes for not just months, but years. Sometimes it takes the form of sexual uh, torture, that is, torture um, that has uh, various sexual dimensions. And that is actually quite common against men and boys as well as against girls and women. 
Um, the, I should note also um, that who carries out sexual violence varies across these conflicts. In some conflicts, it's really agents of the state that engage in widespread sexual violence, but in other settings, it's non-state groups that do so. Um, and let me mention two more particular patterns that are maybe um, not widely uh, understood. One is that the prevalence of gang rape in war is much, much higher than gang rape during peacetime. Mm -hmm. And also, shockingly, I think, to many people, women engage in sexual violence as well in some settings. It's not just men. Wow. Can you, um, I, I'm sitting here wondering uh, if there are any particular countries that you have found to be particularly brutal in terms of um, evidence of sexual violence. I think the countries that are most brutal uh, in terms of the patterns of sexual violence are countries that I have not visited. Okay. Uh, so among contemporary conflicts, I think I would rank probably m above all the rest the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Mm -hmm. In the eastern part of that country, there are ongoing uh, patterns of conflict that um, include a very high level of sexual violence, and that uh, is on a scale um, that we see very rarely. Also in Darfur, uh, there's been a very high level of sexual violence. So mm -hmm. those are two conflicts that I'm relying on my colleagues in the community of non-governmental organizations um, and international organizations who document that violence. I'm relying on their data and documents okay. to understand what's going on there. Um, let's talk a little bit um, about your methodology because I imagine that it's very difficult to um, gather data to analyze this uh, particular type of violence. Tell me about your methodology. You're absolutely right. It's one of the most difficult things to document um, in the social sciences. And uh, I use essentially two methods. The first method is that I rely on non-governmental organizations, government agencies, international organizations to document the patterns of sexual violence. I don't try to do that myself. And um, the kinds of data that have been gathered essentially are of two types. One is eyewitness reports, sometimes from victims, sometimes from uh, uh, people who witnessed sexual violence. And also, um, in some settings, we have medical reports or medical surveys. Um, the, of course, the, there are many risks here to victims of sexual violence, additional risks. Uh, in many settings, if sexual violence report what happened to them, they may be either stigmatized by their own community or they may be targeted by armed groups still in the area. Indeed, even witnesses to sexual violence, if they talk, uh, run some risk. Um, and uh, moreover, in many cultural settings, victims of sexual violence, be they women who've suffered rape or gang rape or girls particularly, or be they boys or men, who have suffered sexual torture, it is extremely difficult in many settings for them to talk about their experience. And indeed, it seems that some victims of sexual violence may become re-traumatized through the retelling of what happened to them. The conditions for doing ethical research through interviews with witnesses and victims of sexual violence are, I think, very narrow. So I don't, in fact, myself uh, interview victims of sexual violence. I rely on the data and documents gathered by others. In addition to uh, gathering the data and documents from these other organizations, I also interview their staff members extensively in these various countries. The other method that I use is to study the internal dynamics of the armed group. So I gather, again, all the data and documents, analyses that I can of the armed groups that I'm looking at, but ideally, uh, at the heart of what I'm doing is uh, interviewing former combatants mm -hmm. about how they were recruited, how were they trained, how um, was discipline within the group carried out. In particular, if someone in their small unit engaged in violence against civilians, was that promoted, was it punished, was it ignored, and so on. 
thank you very much mm -hmm. for sharing some of your research with us today. Thanks, Marilyn. It's been a pleasure. For more information about Professor Wood and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.